I have a few announcements to make here. Uh, first of all, Anne left a note here, it says to announce the Ladies' Aid this Thursday, September 9th, and we will be doing the sheet we had for quilting last month, and tell others that uh, are not here and let them know also. And then uh, we have an insert in our Bolton, and there's a women's conference coming up, uh, and you can read about that in the insert in our Bolton. And then, uh, of course, on Wednesday, September 8th at 7 p.m. is our Bible study and prayer by Zoom. And then next Sunday, we will have our fall schedule starting. We need to remember that. Uh, September 12th with Sunday school beginning at 9 a.m. and worship service at 10.30. And then uh, also there's a note in our boat about Cornerstone and their uh, booth at the fair and about the pies, and you can read that also. So I think that pretty much, uh, does anyone have any other uh, announcement that I, that I might have missed? Okay, we'll turn to the Lord in word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and thank you and praise you for this opportunity that we have to gather in your house again this morning. Thank you and praise you for the beautiful day that you've given us, the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us, both material, physical, temporal, and spiritual. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity that we have to gather now around your word. Pray that you would bless the service, that all that is said and done would be for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'll ask you to stand and we'll turn over to hymn number 271, Fill My Cup, Lord.
Our scripture reading this morning is found over in 1 John chapter 5 and starting uh, verses 4 and 5, which I will read in Jesus' name. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, dear end of the reading of the Scripture. And if you're here this morning trusting in Jesus as your personal Savior, please join me as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried in hell. Third day rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and judge the dead. Believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And I guess uh, for our special music this morning, we're all special. So we'll turn over to page number uh, 499. Am I a soldier of the cross? At this time, we have prayer requests, and uh, as usual, we have a lot to pray about, and so thankful that we can bring our requests before God this morning, knowing that he hears and that he answers prayer. And uh, does anyone have any special prayer requests? I have a list of things that uh, we're going to be praying about, and uh, does anyone have any other special prayer requests to add? We need to continue to uphold and pray those in our midst with health issues and other needs. And we certainly need to continue to remember and to pray for our nation where we're at today. And uh, uh, we need to pray that uh, God can work in lives and hearts even today. We know and we see us where we're headed as a nation. And, I believe that it's all in according to God's plan and his will. I think of the late Jimmy DeYoung, who's now home with the Lord, and he was always talking about Revelation 17:17, 17, 17, and he said that God would use man to fulfill his will, 
And I believe that we can see that in our nation today. You know, the Bible says that in the end time, that there's going to be a one world government, a one world religion, a one world monetary system. And I can, I can see that being implemented in our country today in a real way with the deep state and with uh, heading for the one world government and globalism, which ultimately will be under the rule and the reign of the Antichrist. And I believe with all of my heart, that's where we're headed in our nation today. Our nation has rejected God. Our leaders and our government has rejected God, the things of God. They hate Christianity. They hate Christians. They hate our Constitution and our moral and principal values. And yet, as Christians, we need to pray for our government. We need to pray for our leaders. Most of all, the only change that will take place if they come to recognize and to see that they're a lost sinner and headed for hell and open their lives and their hearts to God and have their lives changed. They'll never seek God until, or the will of God, until they have a change of heart and we need to uphold them in prayer. I know it's not, as Darren has mentioned, it's not always so easy and it's not easy for me to pray for some of these that are connected with the homosexual movement, the transgender and, and abortion and all of that. And yet, as God's people, we need to pray for them that their lives can be changed. They can come to know and to receive Jesus as their personal Savior. And as I said, the nation, our nation is in God's hands. America is in God's hands. His way and will will be fulfilled in our nation. Trent? Add in uh, praise for Texas and their new laws banning abortion down to six weeks. It's not perfect, but it's better than yeah. laws. Well, praise God for that. And we can thank God for victories. And as Christians, we need to pray that God will give us real boldness, that we would dare to be a Daniel, a Shadrach, a Meshach, and a Bendical. And God is very clear in his word. As Christians, we need to oppose, oppose and reprove and bring out the works of darkness and expose them for what they are. And we do know that there's power in prayer and that there's victory in Jesus. And I believe that uh, Trent is going to be sharing about that in our message this morning. Okay, we'll turn to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and thank you again for this privilege that we have to gather around you in the power of prayer. And we bring these requests before you this morning, Lord. We uphold our shut-ins in prayer, those that are in nursing homes, that you would encourage them and strengthen them and be with them. And I pray this morning, God, for uh, those that have health issues in our midst, Ron and Lola, continue to strengthen Ron as he helps Lola. And Lola, as she's going to be going in for scans again, pray that she'll get a real good report. And then I want to continue to uphold Andy Brutus for continued healing in his life. And for Stephan and Marilyn, as Marilyn is, has a problem now with some infection, that your hand would be upon her and just work a real miracle of healing. Want to continue to uphold Jerry Rhinus in prayer also, and that you would do healing in his life. Uphold Jerry Reisler in prayer as he's been in the hospital with health issues, that you just be with him. And then we continue to uphold Jen St. John in prayer. We thank you for the healing that you're doing. Continue to bless her and encourage her. Be with Darren and, and the boys also. Just strengthen them. And then, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you and, and this morning for praises that we have, for healings that you've done. Thank you for the healing that you've done in Jane Falker's 
life with her knee and continue to heal and strengthen. Thank you, God, for the healing and the good report that Jane Volker got on with her cancer. And then we thank you for the healing that you've done in the life of little Mariah Joy, that little girl, and just continue to bless her. And then I want to uphold Anne's sister in prayer also this morning, Lord, that you would be with her and encourage her. And we just thank you and, and pray and uphold Don and Mary in prayer also, Lord. They have health issues and uh, pray for Mary's upcoming surgery for her cataracts that you would guide and lead the doctors. And now, Lord, I pray for the persecuted church all around the world, men and women and boys and girls that are being persecuted for their stand for Jesus and the word of God that you would bless them and encourage them. I pray that you would be with those that are supporting them, Open Doors Ministries, the Door of Hope International and others. Just uphold and supply their needs. And then I want to uphold Christians in Canada, our neighboring country, God, with the persecution up there, with the uh, uh, regulations and the rules and the censorship that you would be with those Christians as they're under a godless government and leadership there also. And then I uphold America in prayer this morning, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, for our leaders, for our government, that you could work in their lives and in their hearts, that they could see their need of Jesus and recognize that Jesus is the answer and the only answer and that he can change lives. And we know, God, as I, as I mentioned, that uh, you use the will of man to fulfill your will. And I believe, God, we can see the new world, the new world order, the deep state, and globalism that's just ahead of us that will be under the rule and the reign of the Antichrist. So help us, God, as God's people, to be faithful and true, to stand up and to be a real light and witness and testimony for Jesus and to uphold those that are outside the fold in special prayer. We want to thank you for victories that have happened in our country, as Trent mentioned, down in Texas. And we just in, continue to uphold and to turn everything over to you in prayer, we know that your holy and divine will will be fulfilled in our nation and in our country. And we just thank you as God's people. We're looking forward to the blessed hope, the trumpet sound of your soon return. And Lord, we don't know as Christians what we might have to go through before that trumpet sounds but God, you know, and I thank you that we can commit it all to you in the power of prayer. And now, Lord, I want to uphold the nation of Israel in prayer, the apple of your eye, that your hand would continue to be upon them. We know your holy and divine will is being fulfilled. And one day, the nation of Israel will recognize you as the Messiah and the Savior, and many will turn to you at a tremendous price. We know we hear a lot about the peace of Israel, and we know that there will never be peace in Israel until the Prince of Peace comes in the millennial reign. And then, Lord, I want to uphold our missions in prayer this morning that we support. I want to pray for the Kenya missions that you'd continue to supply to meet every need. Pray for the American board in decisions that they make and pray that funds will continue to come in for the work over there. And then I want to pray for uh, Marie Sandvik Center and also for Pacific Garden Mission. And I pray this morning for your blessing and continued blessing upon our fellowship here at Bad Axe. Pray that we would continue to be a real light testimony and witness in the community. Pray that you'd be with our church council and our leaders here at Bad Axe, the deacons and, 
and Drew Rogers that we would always remain true to truth and to the Word of God and seek guidance and wisdom from you. I pray for the radio and the television program that funds would come in to continue to support that and there would be much fruit. I pray for our Sunday school and our teachers now that will be starting next Sunday that you would bless them in our Sunday school. Thank you, God, for the young families in our midst and bless them. I thank you for the young families in our midst that have seen the importance of homeschooling their children or sending them to a Christian school as we see what's happening in our schools today all across our nation. And we uphold our children and our young people in prayer this morning, God, for what they're being confronted with, that you would put a guard and a protection around them and be with them. And then I want to thank you this morning for the ministry of Don and Mary here at Bad Axe. Continue to bless and to encourage them. Be with them now at their, as they're at the Bible camp up in Painesville, Minnesota. Bring them back safely to us, Lord. And then, Heavenly Father, I pray for Trent this morning as he shares the message that you would anoint him and you would use him in a real way. And I pray that each one of us would have open and receptive hearts. Thank you most of all this morning, Lord Jesus, for your precious blood that cleanseth from all sin, that you was willing to go to the cross to lay down your life and to shed your precious blood for my sins and the sins of the world that we might be saved and have eternal life. And I thank you that that invitation is going forth even this morning, reaching out to whosoever will can come. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And I thank you, God, this morning for the victory that Christians can have. It tells us over in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you this morning that we can experience that joy, that peace, that happiness, that power, that faith, and that victory in you, Lord Jesus. Now, God, take these tithes and these offerings and use them for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll ask the ushers to please come forward.
Before the message, I'll ask you to turn over to hymn number 358, or no, sorry, number 364, He Leadeth Me. This morning comes from Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, in Jesus' name. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Lord, we just take these words, this scripture, these passages today, and we pray that they would open our eyes to see fear, faith, and everything that's in between those spectrums and we know that you and your right hand is there for us lord with the meditation of our hearts together and the words of my mouth bring us glory bring you glory forever and ever amen 
Good morning. You may be seated. Fear and faith are what I titled my sermon. Sermon. I just said that out loud. Never in a million years did I think I'd be standing in this pulpit preaching a sermon. God has plans for us, and they take us to places that we didn't know. And for this plan, it only took 34 years, not a million. Fear is the first piece I want to focus on today. Fear. What are we fearful of? Public speaking? Maybe calling someone by the wrong name after you've met them before. Maybe fearful of water, fearful of getting lost, or in this day and age, fearful of death seems to be on everyone's mind. The list can go on and on. We all have different levels of fear that we can manage. We all have it. But it's when we get pushed past the line, beyond the line of comfort, that we slip into fear. So let's look at a few accounts that involve fear today. We're going to start out in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And reading from verses 3 through 11. So this is the story of David and Goliath. Starting in verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Now we're going to kind of gloss over some stories today and, and paint the big picture. So we look at David and Goliath, and everybody knows the story there, David and Goliath. But let's look at some of the other parts of this as well. We have a mountain on this side, and we have a mountain on that side, and we have armies filling both sides. So this isn't just 10 people here, 10 people there. There's vast armies and a big valley between them. And out of there, verse 4, went a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. His height was six cubits in a span. Now, I don't know how many cubits I am, but that puts Goliath just over nine feet tall. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set battle in this array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man, and let him come down to me. So here is Goliath putting this challenge forth. Nine feet tall. Just the spearhead on there, it said, weighed um, 600 shekels of iron. Now, I don't know what that means, so I had to look it up. That means just the spearhead was 17 pounds on the front of it. And he was wearing a coat of mail. His armor weighed... Um, 5,000 shekels of brass. Look that up too, because I didn't know what that conversion was. That weighed 125 pounds. So that's half the weight of the average man was just the coat that he was wearing. So this is a big guy standing before them. Picking up in verse 9, If he was able to fight with me, speaking to Israel, and to kill me, then we would be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So fear, we're talking about fear. Again, two armies clashing. One guy comes out and says, I want to do uh, a fight to the death with one of your soldiers. Winner take all. <clears throat> And how do we see the king of Israel and all of them responding to this? In verse 11, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The next account I want to bring up is Gideon. You may be familiar with the story of Gideon. He, was, um, he, he tells the Lord when he's told to go and fight against the Midianites that he is um, the lowest in his family and that his family is the poorest in the region. And the Lord says, well... I'm picking you, and you're going. So he did, and he gets there. And here again, we have another instance where we have a giant valley filled with the Midianites 
and their allies. There's some more there. I think the Amalekites are there and some others as well. So again, not just a little fight in the Valley of Puri. These are big valleys filled with many armies. So Gideon gets there, and the Lord tells him, you have, you have too many people. He has an army of 22,000. So Gideon goes to all the people, and he says, if you're afraid or worried about this battle, you need to leave. And over half of his army leaves because they are fearful. And I have no doubt that when Gideon got there, he told them that the Lord was with them. They are God's people, but they tend to forget that, like some of us sometimes. So after this, it got whittled down to 10,000. And the Lord says, nope, that's still too many. And we know the story. The reason for this is because God wanted to show him that it was his power and faith in him that, that won the battle. So he tells Gideon, go down to the water and have them all drink. And anyone who bends down and laps up the water straight into their mouth, they're, they're going to be asked to leave. But those who cup the water in their hands and, and drink out of their hands, they stay. And he's left with 300 men. Now he started with 22,000, which may have been not enough to begin with for the armies that he was going against. But now it was Gideon and 300 others. Now let's look at the account in Daniel chapter 6 of Daniel and the lion's den. If we look at verses 17 through 19 in Daniel chapter 6, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his place, and passed the night fasting, neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning, and went up in haste unto the den of lions, in verse 19. <clears throat> so here, I, don't want, I want to be careful not to add to scripture, but I'm sure Daniel maybe had his heart rate just a little bit when he was put in the den. But here the king, who, was a, who liked Daniel, and had made a decree that if no one um, would worship at the given time, um, that they would be thrown in there. And so he was dismayed. He was fearful for Daniel because he was the one who made this law and had to throw him in there. So much so that he fasted. He couldn't eat that night. And he couldn't listen to music. And he couldn't even sleep. And then in verse 19, arose very early in the morning. Dawn could not get there soon enough for the king because he was worried about Daniel, who got put into the lion's den. So, we've made it to the book of Daniel. This is where the real passages I want to cover with you are. Well, it's really the first three chapters, but we're going to kind of take a brushing look at them as we go through the first three chapters. So turn with me to Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. So here we open the book of Daniel. And if you'll remember from a few weeks ago, Pastor shared a verse with us in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. I'll read that for you. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So as he spoke on, that time has not been fulfilled yet, the time of the Gentiles. But when this captivity happened, this is the start of that. Daniel 1.1, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and besieged Jerusalem and took everyone captive. So this is in roughly 586 BC. That's what these verses are pertaining to um, as we get into Daniel. So by a raise of hands, who knows who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are? What if I say Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Do your hands still go up? Mine wouldn't always necessarily right away. So who are these people? So they, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are the God-given Hebrew names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I was listening to the radio one day, flipping through the channels, and someone came on, 
and mention this. We need to give them more credit for their Hebrew names. We need to remember those. Those are their God-given names, not their Babylonian names. But it is easy to remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we tend to remember those. So let's all make it an assignment for ourselves to try to uh, remember their Hebrew names a little more forthfront than the others. So Daniel, his name means God is my judge. Hananiah is the Lord's beloved. Mishael is who is as God. And Azariah is the Lord is my help. So they all were given new names. And we see that these children, when, when they were captive in verse 4, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, and skilled in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So Nebuchadnezzar saw these children, brought them in, saw that they were they had all these uh, skills, but he wanted to make them his. So Daniel was renamed to Belshazzar, and that means favored of Bel, which is the Babylonian's main god. And then Hananiah was changed to Shadrach, which is illumined by Rock, which is their sun god, one of their false gods. Mishael was turned to Meshach, and this belongs to Shak is the meaning of his name, and that is the wine goddess. And Azariah was named Abednego, which is the servant, it means servant of Nago. Well, Nago is their equivalent to Lucifer. So we take all of their Hebrew names, and we pretty much got as far from it as we possibly could when the king renamed them. So we know the story that the king, the king takes them in, he wants them to eat their food, and they don't do it. Daniel says, nope, let us have the pulse, the, the vegetables, and, and what um, they didn't want to defile themselves with the king's food. And it turns out that that worked to their favor. So when we look at 1 Daniel chapter um, 1, 17 through 19, where our, our message verse was from, as these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, the king had said he should bring them in, and the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. The king communed with them, and among all of them was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And then verse 20, if we go one more, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king, that the king inquired of them, he found them Here's ten that times round. That well, we know the king issue. was in power. We know he had constantly been searching for people that were able to sit in his court, that would answer all of his questions. And here these, these four show up, and they're ten times better than any of those. <clears throat> As we move forward, in chapter 2, the king has a dream. And the dream is of a statue that has a golden head and clay feet, and he wants to know what this dream means. So he calls Daniel in. And one thing that we need to remember is it isn't just come and tell me what this dream is. They were under penalty of death if they got the dream wrong. And so Daniel comes in, and he interprets the dream for him. And Nebuchadnezzar sees that interpretation as the correct one, and, uh, and, and that Daniel had an understanding. So in the very last two verses of, of chapter 2, 48 and 49... Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors of all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king that he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat at the gate of the king. So he captures them. They are proven to be wiser than any of his other people. And now, a little while later down the timeline, they're set as governors over the provinces in Babylon. And we just finished chapter 2, and we go into chapter 3, and the first two verses there. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and a breadth thereof six cubits. 
Now, I've got to convert all this stuff, like I said earlier, because I don't know what that is. So I looked it up. It's 90 feet tall. Well, I always compare sizes to try to see what it is. Well, Eric's silo is 65 feet tall. I always remember that. I just don't forget. So this is one and a half times the size of his silo, or the average building has a 10-foot floor. So this is a nine-story building. And it was set up in the plains of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers. So he pulled in everybody. You're going to come see my statue. You're going to come and look at this. And not only that, when the music plays, you're all going to bow down and worship it. So at that time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also there. And we see, as we move forward into uh, um, Daniel 3, verse 12, there were certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Now, there's two main points in this passage. One, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down and worship the statue. The other piece I found interesting is in the first line there. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs. So this person coming to the king to say, um, there's some people over here that aren't worshiping like you told them to. And just a reminder, you put them there. Because we know how Nebuchadnezzar was. He was a, a rageful king, and this person coming to bring this message didn't want to fear his wrath. So he tried to subtly remind the king who put him there. So in verse 14, actually in verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage commanded that they be brought forward. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? And they didn't, did they? We see there that they did not worship, they did not fall down, they did not take the easy path like people do in the culture today. Whether you're fearful of looking different, of being different, they knew what was right and wrong. They followed the one true God. So as we continue down in the passage, verse 16, he gives them a second chance. Don't let me forget that. He gave them a second chance. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear the music. Maybe it wasn't loud enough. So he says, here you go, give you a second chance. And they, they don't do it. And he asked for them to answer why. So in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They weren't trying to be sly and say, oh, you know, we didn't hear the music or we didn't do this. They were not careful. They told him exactly why they were not going to bow down and worship. And that was because of the false gods and the statues and images that you were putting in place. And in verse 17 and 18 is where we really take the key. If it be so, God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Because that was the punishment if you didn't, get, uh, if you didn't bow down, was to be thrown in the fiery furnace. He will deliver us from that. And if he deliver us out of thy hand, O king, but if not... Be it known upon thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image with thou, which thou hast set up. So they knew exactly the punishment that was to befall them, and they still trusted in God. There was one God to worship, and it didn't matter the outcome for themselves. They had no fear, and they showed no fear. So we see Nebuchadnezzar then is even further enraged. He heats the furnace seven times hotter than it was previously, and he bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He threw them in, and we see that the fire was so hot that it engulfed and killed the men who threw them in there. Now if we go forward a few verses to Daniel 3, 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. So he's so enraged, but he did remember that he threw three people in, 
And now he sees four in verse 25. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So it's interesting here. The king instantly noticed that there was four. I mean, he has other matters to attend to, but he was trying to make an example of them. But what does he notice about that fourth form? It was the form of the Son of God. Now, I think only to further emphasize the power that God has, it continues in the passage to tell us that not a hair was burned on their heads, and nor did their clothes even smell like smoke. Now, it makes me think of a campfire. We've all sat around a campfire, and that wind just blows even one time. You've picked the wrong side to sit on, and poof, you're covered in smoke for three days. You can't get that smell out of your hair, your clothes. It's there. These guys were in the fire walking around, and it had not touched them at all. So after they were pulled from the fire, which Nebuchadnezzar told that to, uh, commanded to be done, he made a new decree that everyone was to follow the God of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now to, now, to be honest, when I first started thinking about this sermon, I was thinking about the fear that would be in the minds of people like David when he was fighting Goliath, Gideon when he was facing the 300 men, Daniel spending the night in the lion's den. But we see in all these circumstances that they all had faith in God, that no matter what, he was with them and he was by their side. Isaiah 41, verse 10 and verse 13, I'd like to share with you. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee, and I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And verse 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Now, as we saw with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that doesn't mean that they're going to get through every situation, right? God has a plan for us, and we see where that takes place. So if we turn back, let's, let's um, finish up our stories of the first three men that we talked about. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 34, And Daniel said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lion out of the flock. So this is what David is coming up to tell Saul when Goliath is there. I was a shepherd, and there was lions and bears that came and took a lamb, and I went out and I smote them. I killed them. I, I took that lamb back and I brought it back to the flock, and Goliath is going to be no different. I'm going to go and do the same to him. And in verse 36, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine should be as one of them. Now this last part is really where it hits home. Seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. So da David wasn't going to do this just because he thought he was a strong guy. It was because they were going against God's people and against God himself. So the story continues that Saul says, okay, okay, we'll let you go. And he gives him all this armor. And David puts it on, and he can't move, and he says, no, 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 I don't, I don't want any of this. Um, so he, he takes it all off, and he just goes as he normally does. And he picks up five smooth stones and his sling, and he heads into battle. And we know how that battle ended. David had faith in God that day, and God won the battle that day. And in Gideon's case, in chapters 6 and 7, 300 men were split into three companies of 100 each with torches and jars and trumpets. And they surrounded the Midianites and all their allies. Now remember, it's not an army of 10 people. It's a whole valley filled with them. And these 300 men circled it around. And then in the darkness, in the early morning hours, they blew their trumpets. They smashed the jars so that their torches lit up. And when this all happened, the Midianites ran they fled, they cried, and they brought sword against sword on their own people because they didn't know what was taking place. And then we see that after this, they all fled, and Israel chased them down and finished the fight. Now, we see that Gideon had faith that day, faith in God that it would be delivered and that his plan would be fulfilled. 
God won the battle that day. And back in Daniel chapter 6, we see that Daniel was pulled out of the lion's den. He was saved because God closed the mouth of the lions. King Darius was exceedingly glad, it tells us, in verse 23. Chapter 6, verse 23. Then the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God, the one true God, the living God. So Daniel's faith saved him that day and God won the battle. What battles do we have in our lives? Have you called on God? Do you have faith in God? Is God's will being done in each of our lives today? Do you trust him? Do you follow him? We all have fears from time to time, and I have no doubt that we will have more. But God said, have no fear, for I am with you. And what are those situations in life? Is it walking up to someone and telling them about Jesus? Is it a hard circumstance in your life that you're not sure where the end is? We don't need to fear because we have faith in God. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that we can trust in you. We can put our faith in you, and we do not need to fear. We are only man, and we know that we will. But as it told us in Isaiah, your right hand is on us. Your hand of protection is with us. You are at our side. And we know that we can take each day one step at a time, praising you, showing glory to you, the one true God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Trent. Uh, please stand and turn over to hymn number 358, God Will Take Care of You.
so thankful for the message that was shared this morning and the truth in that message. And as Christians, we can have our faith and trust in Jesus, knowing that he has promised to go with us all the way. He said in his word, I will be your guide even on to death. What a promise that is. And as I've mentioned before, I don't know what's ahead, but God knows, and our times are in his hands, and we can trust in him, and knowing that if we know Jesus as our personal Savior, the best is yet to come. What a promise. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and thank you for the message that was shared. Thank you that invitation is going forth even this morning. And I pray this morning that if there was one here that has never trusted you as personal Savior, that even today, that they might open their heart and their life to you and come and confess and repent of their sin and receive you as their personal Savior and have that blessed hope, that blessed assurance, that blessed uh, assurance that, uh, of meeting you one day and help us now, God, to go forth this week. And as Trent brought forth in the message, that we might put our faith and our trust in you and be a real light and a witness and a testimony for Jesus that we unashamedly would be willing to hold forth your word and your truth. And above all, God, give us a love and a burden for men and women and boys and girls that are still outside the fold of God. I pray this morning, God, that you would use us to be a light, a witness, and a testimony, and to be a soul winner for you. We can't save anyone in ourselves, God, but you can use us to present the message, and then you can save. So bless us now as we go out this week, just give us a real strength and peace in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our benediction, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.